Our first speaker today is Deputy Medical Examiner Sarah Barth and Allison Weiss, but this is just Sarah Barth, not Allison Weiss. So there are going to be some pictures, like I told you, in the announcement. So if you got a queasy stomach, close your eyes. Do you see the mouse here? Okay. So as you said, my name is Sarah. I'm one of the deputy MEs from Waukesha County. I've been there for about seven years now. Um, and today you're stuck with me instead of Allison. So, <laughs> and like you said, there are pictures. So don't, I won't be offended if you look away. I just ask no recording of the pictures. Um, just because they're very, gra they can be very graphic depending on your perspective. So that's better. So we're going to begin with coroner versus medical examiner. Does anyone know if there's a difference or if they're the same thing? Does anyone want to try to guess? I'm pretty sure the coroner is unrelated to criminal justice and the medical examiner stands for forensics. Kind of, kind of, good guess. Um, the difference is a, they're basically the same thing. The only difference is that coroners are elected. So it's politics and you don't really need experience, you just need to do a good campaign, whereas at ME's office, you need to be qualified. It's going to be on your test, coroner versus medical examiner. Coroner is elected, medical examiner not. So Waukesha has had a medical examiner since the early 90s or late 80s. Most coroner systems are going away in Wisconsin, and it, every county is different. So. This is an older map, but if you can see on there, the um, light blue, orange, and yellow are all medical examiners, and the pink and the tan are coroners, so it's mostly up north. But we're both responsible for the same things. The functions of our office we, our primary function is to investigate deaths that occur in Waukesha County. It goes, there's a lot more detail though about that. We have to investigate deaths of a sudden, unexpected, violent, um, or suspicious nature. And their Wisconsin State Statute 979 lays it all out of what we need to investigate. And we'll get more into that when we see the photos. Our office, like I said before, wow. Christ. Good morning. It works. <laughs> so, the, while following state statute 979, our primary tasks are to determine the cause and manner of death for deaths that fall under that statute. We also provide court testimony for cases that go to trial. That's usually homicides. Sometimes it is, would be drug deaths, but not very often. I've only been called in to testify once. So, it doesn't happen very often here in Waukesha. And then for the cause and manner, the cause is the event initiating the death, and the manner is the category of the type of death. And that's very important to remember. And there are five categories or manners of death. Anything other than natural, like let's say you die in a hospital and it's not a natural death, we have to sign the death certificate, and that's because of state statute. So, yes. When you have like fatal overdoses and or like witnesses, they didn't do it to try to kill themselves, but actually they still pass. What category would that go under? Accident. Accident. Mm -hmm. Unless it was intentional or there's a history and we don't know for sure. Let's say last week they talked about suicide, but they've been doing fine. Then maybe that would be unexplained just because you can't pick between the two. But unless it's clear, we don't just call it a suicide. So did you have a question? Yeah. Um, what would be an example of like an unexplained? How would that happen? Unexplained? Like I did, like. The example he just brought up would be, let's say you have someone with a long history of suicide attempts or statements, 
but uh, now, th but they've been doing fine for a couple weeks or a couple months, and now all of a sudden they're dead of an overdose or that's probably that's the biggest example of an overdose. Um, but we can't tell for sure, so we can't call it a suicide because it could be because they have that history, but there's nothing new that they said or did. But it. It also looks more of an accident, but you can't ignore their hi their recent history, if that makes sense. So that's the biggest one, is between suicide and accident. Sometimes you just can't tell. Any other questions before I continue? Sorry, it's a big room, so I can't always see hands. Okay. These are old statistics, as you can see. Um, I believe we put these in here in December of the end of last year. So total cases we investigated, like scenes or phone calls from hospitals or nursing homes, we had about 1450. This year, I believe we're way past that. We had 430 scenes, just about, between six, seven people, that's a lot, to cover 24 seven. And of course, I always have the most, just perks of my shift or my luck. <laughs> 421 of those 1450 cases were brought in for exam. And that means we signed the death certificate on those. We released the, the majority of the cases, which means we either get a house death where they're elderly or they have very obvious natural disease and they have doctors, so we can release to the funeral home and their doctor can sign the death certificate. If that's not the case, they have to come in for an autopsy or an external physical exam. Does that make sense? Okay. Referred, that's a whole other topic, but basically if someone dies in Waukesha County, but they had an accident or an incident that caused their death that happened in another county, we refer it to that county. That usually happens with like Washington or Milwaukee, old person, it's usually an older person, they fall at home, they break a hip or they hurt themselves, they come to one of our hospitals where they die. Since they died as a result of that accident, it is that county's job to sign the death certificate. It's very tricky. And cremations, that's important. We did 1,400 about last year. Um, anytime someone's gonna be cremated in Wisconsin, it is our responsibility to examine that person from head to toe to check for missed injuries or cases that didn't get reported. So that's a lot. It's not very often we find a missed injury. Usually we find recent surgical scars where when they died at the hospital or the nursing home, they should have called us right away instead of calling the funeral home to run the case by us to see what we need to do. Um, but usually it's just fine. We just go in, it takes about 10, five minutes and we drive around all the funeral homes in the area. So, any questions before I continue? Okay. Most of our cases are natural in Waukesha, thankfully. I don't know what this year's looking like. This year's looking pretty bad. We've had quite a lot of suicides and overdoses, but I have not seen the statistics. Unfortunately, I've been a little too busy to look that up. Um, and very thankfully, we have a very, very, very low homicide rate. I think we usually, the most we'll have a year is maybe five, if anything. And accidents include lots of things, falls, car accidents, overdoses, um, drownings, electrocution, Hypothermia, hyperthermia are considered accidents, bee stings. Our office, oh goodness. So at our office this year, we have two forensic pathologists. They are the ones who run the office. They do the autopsies, they sign the death certificates. Um, they're the main two people. Underneath them, you have the three autopsy assistants. So if you're interested in autopsies, forensic pathology or autopsy assistant or path assistant is the way to go. 
They do the cutting with the doctors during every exam. They help with the specimens, sending out toxicology, ordering slides, and they work side by side with the doctor. And then you have the investigators or the deputy medical examiners. We are the ones who go in the field. So we're the ones who are on call 24 seven with our old brick pagers. Anytime there's a death in the county, whether it's a house death or a car accident, someone out in a field, whatever, we get paged to respond um, to determine if we're signing the death certificate or if it's natural and we can release to a funeral home and have the primary doctor sign. Does that make sense? I have apologies, I don't know when the pictures start. I didn't put this together, so. The pathologists, their duties are to perform the autopsies and externals. They test, they're the ones who mostly testify in court. They are medical doctors, so they're the ones, they're the professionals. They sign the death certificates, they review the medical records and the toxicology results. And they have a lot of education. Like I said, they're MDs. They're just like any other doctor. They just don't treat live patients. So they have a medical degree and residency and fellowship and they have to keep taking their boards to stay certified and licensed and all of that. If that's something you're interested in, I highly recommend it because there is not enough. Um, they don't make good money. Is that what I just heard? Yeah, they don't because you work for the government. So I think that's why a lot of people don't want to do it. Whereas if you work for a clinic or a hospital or a private practice, you tend to make more. It's like 200 some thousand here in your guys' office. Is it? Yeah. Oh, she's a... Oh, geez. Keep in mind our main ME, our medical examiner, has been there for almost as long as I've been alive. So she's kind of at the way top of the scale. <laughs> Um, I think she's been there since the early 90s, so, um, yeah, she's been there for a while. Um, I think they get paid great, but I think, in, I hear in comparison to regular live people doctors, they don't, so. Path assistance, basically, for our office, we're special. I don't know what the other people or places need. Um, we just require a bachelor's degree and a related field, whether it's science, um, if you do funeral home stuff, or four years work experience in death investigation. Two of our path assistants were funeral directors way back in the day. Um, so, This is our autopsy suite. We have three autopsy stations with Obviously sinks, everything you could possibly need, protective equipment. For every autopsy and exam we do, we collect specimens, blood, urine, bile, vitreous, which is the fluid in the eye. Um, the bottom left picture is what we use to cut the ribs to take the chest plate off to do the autopsy, and the bottom right is the bone saw for taking the skull cap off. Like I said, externals are just like physicals. Height, weight, scars, hair color, trauma, surgical sites. We have some examples. <laughs> So obviously these are all examples of trauma. Um, these were cases that were probably reported by the hospital or the nursing home that said, hey, this person just had a surgery or an accident, but they died and never recovered. So they had to come to us for an external exam. And then we order the medical records and our doctor signs the death certificate. You can see the two on the left are obviously stapled incisions. The bottom right is pretty obvious. It's a broken wrist. The top right, Top right, though, is a little less obvious. Um, you can see the right leg is shortened. That means there's a hip fracture. So that's something we look for at our cremation exams in case it gets missed. But that's a very, very clear sign of a hip fracture. 
top left is obviously the blood spatter. That is from either a gunshot wound, I believe, where it dripped down on the person. You can tell by the way the drips are. It didn't really spray. It kind of landed. Bottom right is a broken femur sticking out. That is an open fracture. Top right is a severed arm, clearly. And then the bottom right is, I believe, it's some kind of sharp wound. I don't know if it was like an ax or a knife or what hit him there, but that's a sharp wound. So this is all part of the external exam. Does anyone know what the top left mark is called besides hanging? Yes. It also could be called known as a furrow. Look at your furrow. But yes, good job. And the bottom right you, is just a comparison to see we, whenever there's a gunshot wound, we always have the guns brought in um, and compared to the wound, just to make sure it makes sense that the gun there makes sense with the wound. And you can see, obviously, this one did. Just two more examples of comparing weapons. The one on the left, this was a work accident where for some reason that piece of wood went and hit this guy in the abdomen. It didn't pierce anything, but it completely mangled his liver and he died at the hospital. I should probably flip it, but if you flip the wood, you'll be able to see that it matches up. And the one on the right was a homicide and we're just matching up the hatchet to the multiple wounds on the head. Burns, we don't get them very often, but this was someone who got burned, but they were in the hospital for a while. So they, the burns had a chance to start healing. This, this person, did not make it to a hospital, obviously. Um, this is the most severe type of burn case we'd see, and that they're very rare, thankfully. But what? Oh, of course. So I don't know if you can see. So the head's at the top. These are the arms. You could see they're starting to curl in like this. It's called the pugilistic posture. So when you die in a fire, your muscles start to contract and your legs and arms start to, everything starts to curl in. It's very often, which it's very hard to see here on the right side of the screen, the hand and the wrist broke off. You could tell because it's more white on the bone, so fire got to the bone because it fell off and it was able to get in there. And this side you could see the hand curling in. And I'm sure the feet, if they're still there, are doing this, have done the same. Needle punctures becoming more, more common. Um, you can see, maybe, um, on A, it's a little darker, which means it's a more fresh puncture wound. B, it's a little lighter, so a little, little older. And we, whenever it's a suspected overdose, we always look because we can test that for drugs or um, to see if it was a recent injection site. So, And then we get into the infections. So the, the top one, there are a lot of people who get what's called peripheral vascular disease or they have diabetes and they don't take care of themselves so everything breaks down. There's no blood flow. They get one little cut, and it turns into this. A lot of people don't want to go to doctors. So it continues to spread, and then we find them at home like this, or they do make it to a hospital, but it's too late. The one, two on the bottom, I believe, are from the same person. This person, I believe, was dead on the, f alive on the floor. She fell, didn't want her family to pick her up, so she laid there and her skin broke down and she ultimately died after being on the floor for about a week. Because she wouldn't let her family call for help and for some reason they just didn't. So.
Now we go into the autopsies, which are going to probably be a little more graphic if that wasn't graphic enough. All autopsies, they're pretty much done the same way. After the external, we start with the Y incision. I'm sure you all heard of a Y incision. And everything's reflected back. So this is your standard, non-traumatic looking Y incision. All organs are taken out with the help of the path assistants. They do most of the, most of the cutting for the doctors. Top left is obviously the brain. They section it. Bottom one is the heart. Part of it is sectioned. I couldn't tell you what part because I always forget. And the top right is a heart that's very enlarged. So it's not supposed to be that big. So they look at every organ, you know, brain, um, lungs, kidney, spleen. They do this to all of them. I'm pretty sure there's more pictures. This is the artery in the heart. So when you think of plaque buildup, heart attacks, this person, I don't know what the percentage here is, but this is all plaque buildup, and this is only space where the blood could get through. So they had significant heart disease, and that's probably why they died in this example. This isn't a heart attack. This is just severe heart disease, because that's the plaque buildup in there. And then the, the one on the right, you can see this white spot. That's scarring from an old heart attack in the heart, obviously. So, Liver on the top left, it's supposed to be shiny, pink, smooth. This is cirrhotic. It's bumpy, it's yellow, it's, that's cirrhosis. Bottom right is kidneys that are very diseased. There's also supposed to be pink, smooth, shiny, and smaller, but they have cysts on them. They're not what they're supposed to be. What do you think the bottom right, or the one on the right is? Does anyone want to guess? What'd you say? Close. This is um, this. Uh, the throat that splits into the lungs from, yep, lungs are right here. Um, this person died from soot and smoke inhalation. So, and then the, t the one on the left, this is called the circle of Willis in the brain. This little thing here and this little thing here, they were aneurysms that popped. These are the type of aneurysms, they're also called berry aneurysms. They're the ones that just get you. Like when you think of a brain aneurysm falling down and dying, this is what they mean. So. Gallstones, stomach contents. I believe the stomach contents here on the, well, the stomach contents, there are some pill fragments and some noodles. Our doctors go through all the stomach contents because if there's pills, then you, that could be more indicative of a suicide if there's a question. If you see a whole bottle of pills in their stomach, that can definitely prove your point of suicide. Okay, any questions before I continue about autopsies, externals, basic functions? There's better pictures, but. It's my favorite part of every class is watching everybody stretch. They get, I think they get worse. Are you stretching or asking? Okay, what's up? Um, what made you want to do this job? I started off as an intern because I, when I was in school, like you guys, and for some reason I just liked it. Um, it's one of those jobs you have to do to know if you like it. And it's very interesting. It's a puzzle. It's mostly helping the family. So it's a combination of criminal justice, social work, like therapy, forensic, science, all of that into one. So if you don't really know what you want to do, but you like all of those and you can handle it, it might be good for you because as I'm about to get into, it's not just about the bodies, it's also about the families. Because you have to coach them, counsel them, explain things. They're sobbing at you, yelling, screaming. So there is a, 
you're kind of like a therapist or a psychologist in a way sometimes. And so I would say it just fit into what I liked at the time. So, yeah. Um, what would you say is like um, a case that can send you home Uh, the one-year-old who got ran over by his mom. I'm sure you remember that call. She was pulling in the driveway to pick up her kids. He ran in front of the car she didn't see because she was looking that way at the other kids and ran over his head. Picked him up after and apparently had brains on her while she swallowed him. And she was also pregnant at the same time and... So that one is probably the biggest that I can think of right now. Um, another example, I guess, would be the two kids who you saw that burn victim. I had two of them in a car accident who were even worse because they weren't found for, until the fire was nearly out. So the two teenage boys. So, any other questions? Yeah. How like, long do you think it doesn't take for a person in a fire to like completely die? Usually not that long. Um, if they're not dead from any injury, like the car accident that can kill them first, I would say within seconds or minutes, because once that carbon monoxide and that soot and, soot and smoke get you, it's not that long. I hope. Fires. Obviously fires are fed, and you learn about this when we do fire EMS, but fires are fed by oxygen, right? And if you're in an enclosed vehicle with the windows up, all that oxygen is taken up pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. you'll die of asphyxiation before yeah. smoke inhalation or anything like that because there's no oxygen there. And plus, if you're in a car accident, you already have some kind of trauma that your body's already fighting. So it's pre pretty quick, I hope. Okay. Well, then I'm going to continue if there's no more questions. I'm going to get more now into what I do as an investigator with some scene pictures and more body pictures. Um, so I talked a lot about the path assistants, the doctors, the autopsies, but we are the ones that do, I'm a little biased, but we do most of the duties, most of the work. Um, so we're, like I said, we cover 24 seven between the six or however many there are of us. That's a lot. We're in the office 40 hours a week. We split the call during the week. But on the weekends, you're on call for 24, 36 hours by yourself, holidays, there's always someone on call. We investigate all the deaths we talked about. When we're at a scene, so we get there, we interview the families, law enforcement, EMS if they're still there. We do body exams, which I'll have pictures. We pronounce the person deceased. Paramedics are not allowed. Um, and we don't allow paramedics to really call doctors at hospitals or their med base to pronounce. Pretty sure that's a Wisconsin thing. So we have to go out to pronounce or with the whole COVID, our doctors might pronounce over the phone. If, if it's a high suspected COVID case or it's very obviously natural witnessed kind of thing. We transport our own bodies for the most part. With COVID, obviously that's changed. But if we're at a scene and the body has to come in for any type of exam or the next of kin can't be found or there's no funeral home, the family refuses to pick, the police help us bag the body up and put it in our Suburbans. When we get back, we have to unload it by ourselves and put it in the cooler. And that's bodies of all different types, sizes, decomp, yeah. What do you do with those? With what? For, oh, like disposing of bodies. Like oh, like if we get a COVID body? Yeah. Um, thankfully, we haven't had to bring any in, but um, no, we don't dispose of any bodies. Um, we bring them in. We just, we're very safe. We disinfect everything, very minimal contact, and then they go right to the funeral home. If we had to do an autopsy, maybe the isolation room, we have a special room, but we haven't had to do that. If it is a COVID case, and it doesn't need an autopsy, we don't even bring them in just to be safe. We'll just do it off medical records, which is not ideal, which is something we've never had to do before. But just to be safe, that's how we handle that. Yeah? Any research on how long COVID lives in a dead body? I don't know. 
I don't know. I get asked that all the time. I hear different stuff every day. I've heard cooling ki will kill COVID in the cooler. I've heard heat will do it. So I, I can't answer that. Too many unknowns. Um, yes, so we bring the bodies in. One of the biggest things we have to do, not only do we interact with the family at the scenes or the, during our cases, we're the ones who primarily do the notifications. So if you die in a car accident and your family's local, we go to your front, their front door and we notify them of your death. That's probably one of the hardest things we have to do. Like those two boys I talked about in the fire, I had to go do both of those back to back and they were like 18, 19, so it didn't go very well. Identification is a big thing. We do not identify based off driver's licenses. So for all of you who are gonna be cops, in Waukesha County, please, please, please remember, we will never use a driver's license for positive identification. I don't know about you, but I don't look like my license. People lie. They change so often. There's glasses, there's no glasses. Just, we don't do it. We take a more scientific approach. So if you're not visually identified by a family member or someone who actually knows you, I'm gonna take a picture and find someone who knows you and show it to them. Make them sign a form. If you're decomposed or you have a gunshot wound that's too traumatic that you can't be identified, we're going to get dental x-rays. Or sometimes we'll do DNA. What else do we do? Tattoos are very, we don't do them as much unless it's very unique. There's one more I'm forgetting. Can't remember. But we'll never use a license. It's very important to remember. We testify. We talked about that. We bring in all medications. So if I bring a body in from a house, I'm bringing your medicine in with me. We used to count them. Thankfully, we don't anymore because of COVID. Because some people would have buckets full and would take a few days. And that's just to see, were you taking your medicine? Because your family can say, yep, they were taking their medicine like they're supposed to. And I'll be like, no, they were not. They haven't touched these meds in, in a year. Because some people lie or they hide it very well. Or I can see that a whole bottle of one of your newest medications is missing. Okay, did you down the whole bottle or what happened there? So. Another thing we do is tissue and organ donation coordination. You've heard of organ donation in hospitals. You're on the ventilator, they come, they take your organs. But once you die, there's something called the tissue bank where they can come and procure tissue within a certain amount of time after you die if you meet certain requirements. So skin, they usually take it off the back. Long bones, heart valves, your corneas, stuff like that. You may have on your license you want to be a donor. In at least this area, even if it's on your license, they still won't do it without your family's permission. I don't know why they do that, but we owe it. they always have to get next of kin consent. So keep that in mind. We're the ones who provide the autopsy results. So you've all seen doctor writing or heard the jokes. Imagine that an autopsy right, like autopsy results, a whole page that you have to interpret and dumb down to a crying, grieving family. So I went into this with just criminal justice with no medical background. You have to learn medical termino terminology very quick. Not only that, you have to be able to dumb it down enough, dumb it down is not the right term, but simplify it enough for the grieving families to understand. Because they'll fight you on it, they won't understand it, and you have to explain it and be prepared for any type of a million questions that they could have for you. And we also have to provide it to the police. They're pretty easy. And then the only other thing that, we can, that she has on here that we do is reenactments. That usually pertains to baby or infant deaths. I believe we have a picture in there. So whenever a baby dies, except for the car accident one, because like let's say you put the baby gets put down for a nap and doesn't wake up, or I think that's usually the biggest, like sleeping. They go in for a nap and they go in to get them and something's wrong. So what we do is because you cannot physically prove co-sleeping or unsafe sleeping environment, we have to do a reenactment with those people so we can see physically what 
happened. We take a baby doll, we go to the house right away if we can, before we even go look at the baby or go get the baby or whatever. We go to the house, we ask them to put the baby doll down, how they put them for their nap. And then how they were found when they woke up, where they found wedged, with their nose pressed against the slat in the crib. You know, were they under five blankets or, because that helps our doctor understand what happened, because she won't see anything at the autopsy. Okay. And our education is a four-year degree, minimum. Like I said, mine's criminal justice or four years work experience. We have a couple people with anthropology backgrounds, microbiology, and nursing. So. This is the back of our suburban on the left. Technically, we can't fit two bodies. If you move the garbage can, we try not to, and it's very rare that we have to. All the supplies and protective equipment, especially these days that we need, gloves, gowns, goggles, masks. We wear a mask everywhere, just like you guys have to now. Um, homicide kits, body bags of all sizes, you name it. Evidence tape little vials if we need to collect you know, bugs or samples or swabs of anything, body tags if you need to lock, because we always lock the body bags with, with the locks, um, swabs, I don't go in there very much, so tape, it's very old, we don't use it that much, so. And you're going to see this, but there are a lot of misconceptions about this job. It's not glamorous at all, especially now that we have to wear a mask. It's bad enough that you're sweating while you're heaving a body up or down the stairs. Try it with a mask. We're not crime scene investigators. We, don't, we typically don't do the swabbing or collecting samples unless it's a homicide. We don't, you know, we don't carry a gun. We don't interview suspects like you see on the t TV shows. We don't do any of that. We go in, we do our investigation, our interviews, get the body and go. Post, the testing post-mortem is not fast. These days, toxicology alone, the first round takes three months. I know on TV shows they say it takes seconds, but... Um, and these days with all the new drugs that keep coming out that we don't know about, what happens is we send in the basic testing first. Three months later, we get the results. And that'll tell us where we need to go. Do we need to send out another round or two? Can we sign it with what we have, the death certificate with what we have? You just, you never know. There's all these new drugs coming out. And that's also important for the police. Is it lens bias or len bias? Perfect, you know all about that. So you can't prosecute that without our cause of death or go after that without our cause of death. Um, and if we don't have the drug that you guys think you have with your suspect, you don't have a case. So that's why our testing takes so long because we work very hard to do the extra testing to help the police find that drug or get that suspect or give them the results that they're looking for. And if it's not, then it's not. So. And another big thing is specific time of death cannot be determined unless it was witnessed. So unless I... That's okay. So unless I see you fall over dead right now, it can't be determined specifically. What we can do is, when we get there, we'll do a body exam. We'll look at post-mortem changes, which I'm going to talk about, which I'm sure is also on your test, so pay attention to that, to give us a general idea of when you may have died, but it's not specific. We don't do liver temperatures in our office. Um, our doctor, and if you think about it, it's not very accurate because your body adjusts to the temperature around you. If you have an illness or a fever or infection, your body temperature is already going to be off. And so we don't do that. So scene examples. I don't think there's bodies in these pictures. I think these are just scenes. And it's just to remind you that we can get called to anything, any condition, any time of the day, anywhere. Hoarder houses are always a joy. So on the left is the entrance. 
to the back door. And this is how I had to make my way to the front door through this house to get a decomposing elderly gentleman. Hoarding cases are way more common than mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think. I would say we get one every couple of weeks or so, at least. And it might not always be a death, but police department or EMS will respond out there and then they have to get, um, what agency? Like get fire or ADRC or something? Yeah, or? like code officials out there basically and tell them to clean it up, otherwise the house is going to be condemned or something like that. So it's way more common than people think. Mm -hmm. This is another example. There is a body in here that Allison, the other presenter, put. This is her example. It sounds bad, but she does it as kind of a Where's Waldo thing. And I forget every time. I think she's right here somewhere. There's a body in here. So this is just her example. I unfortunately can't tell you because I know it's in here somewhere. Car accidents. This was a convertible who I believe she was high on heroin at the time. She was in her 60s. It was a road that was like 50 or 55 and she crossed the center line. You could see her in the bottom picture. It took hours and hours to get her out of there. Car fires. Two separate examples, the person in the inside of the top left car hit the windshield. And the person on the bottom right was a pedestrian or someone hit by a car. You can see the outline of their legs, and that's where they hit the windshield. There's the indent going inwards. Um, gunshot wounds, two separate examples. They can be extremely messy like these two, or they can be in a car like the one on the right. Sometimes you don't see blood at all. We recently had one where a guy was in his car, I think he used like a 22, in his mouth, so there was no evidence of trauma. We just happened to see the gun and look in the mouth and see a little bit of blood, and turns out it was a gunshot wound. So it's not always as messy as you think. And shotgun. These are very, very PC examples of a shotgun wound. And we are expected to get as much of the brain matter as possible. We don't do cleanup, like we don't clean up the blood. That's not our role. There are agencies for that. But we are expected to get as much of the brain matter and skull fragments as we can. Incised wounds. Top left, obviously it's not all blood, but bloody water. We're, exp we're the ones who have to go in and drain it. And then with the help of our lovely police and fire, get, her, get that person out. We collect, the police collect the weapons to bring to the autopsy to compare. The one on the right, I believe he was a sex offender. He was found right next to the tub. You can see he wrote forgive me in his blood in the bathtub and he had pictures of little kids. So, train deaths. Allison loves to include these. I think these are both hers. As you can see in the top left, she's holding an eyeball. And on the bottom right, he was just cut right in half. We are expected to also get every piece that we can find. Even if it's the pouring rain or the middle of winter, we're supposed to get as much as we can. Last thing we need is the family to go out there and find something. Decomps. We are in the middle of decomp season, especially with COVID. And I say that because now that people are not going out anymore, they're not allowed to, they have to stay at home. You can't visit with people. It's kind of normal not to talk to people as much anymore. So you're not, they don't talk to you for two, three months. They don't think anything of it because of COVID and quarantine, when really you've been dead most of that time. 
Uh, the question. Um, you just brought up that you have to like um, get every piece of the body. Yes. So there was an incident a few years ago that an accident of two women in front of my in-laws house. They hit a tree and obviously they were pronounced dead at the scene. Mm -hmm. um, they took the bodies, they cleaned up the scene, but what if you guys did that and let's say there's still like a missing piece of the body, like a liver? Because what happened was my kids went outside, obviously to go look at the scene after it was done, with their grandpa, and they found still, you know, they found the liver sitting by the tree. So let's say we didn't call you guys to tell you if you had a missing piece, like what do you do? I mean, it sounds weird. Like, do you no, go it's not back weird. and search or do you We you might go back and search. Just an animal? It depends on the situation. There's we've never gone back to look. Okay. Um, I think at that point, depending on how long it's been, you assume an animal has come and gotten it already. But if it's something big like a whole liver, I imagine they would send us back. But then again, you also have to assume it could be in the car. Yeah, that's I'm just wondering if you didn't come up with pieces. Yeah. You know, like, what do you do, or how do you document it? Yeah. In the autopsy report, it would say it was missing, and we don't know where it is. That would be the most. They may send us back if it, they believe there's a good chance or it's important for, let's say, toxicology to find that liver. But then again, you have to go on the assumption, how do we know that's from that person or those persons. I mean, hopefully you would not have a random liver at a car accident scene after, but you can't assume, but I, can't, I don't have the best answer for that because it hasn't happened. Well, it has happened now that you bring it up, but I think we would just assume an animal had gotten it. That's terrible to say, but as far as I know, we've never been sent back. We had a call a couple, uh, maybe a month ago or so for a motorcycle accident in the summit area. South Wakanwa, and at least one of the victims in the accident ended up losing a leg, and they found it was actually laying in the middle of traffic. Um, but there was some confusion between fire and police on scene, and what they were told at the hospital, and they were under the impression that they were missing another leg. So we actually sent New Berlin's K9 lights and sirens across the county to go search for a missing leg that was somewhere near there. Ended up, there was only one missing leg and we had it, but that's always a possibility too. If it's something big and noticeable, not like an internal organ, but I mean, those canines can track for pretty much anything, so. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes like the case, that example with the liver, if that's underneath the car, if there's so much damage, I'm not surprised it got missed because we, oh, we don't wait till the car's removed. Once we get the body out, we go, because we got to do next of kin notification and identification. So that's also a possibility. And then the co tow company either didn't point it out or the, no one else saw it. So. It's one of the reasons why after accidents, fatal accidents, they'll tow the vehicle back to fleet instead of a tow yard, or they don't release the vehicle back to the family until the investigation is totally over. So they can always go back that way as well. Any other questions? Yeah. What for the snow? What'd you say? What about the snow? Like, when you go to these things, they're like people going to so, like, is there anything you can use for the smell? Oh, for the smell, no. Some officers and police, or officers and fire will use Vicks, or they'll put on the big fancy respirator stuff, but nothing. I don't wear that stuff. We don't even wear a regular mask, except for these days we have to but nothing helps. And we're so close to the bodies and involved ver versus the police that when we get back to the office or go home, we smell like it. There's just no avoiding it. It's one of the very big unglamorous downsides to the job. So, yeah. How do you like cover the smell for like the family or like kids? How do I cover, how do I cover up the smell? Yeah. Oh, I just change right away, take a shower. That's all you can really do. Like, I've never had them smell it. Usually once I get back to the office, I for douse myself in Febreze and spray, and I have body wash, shower stuff at work if I need it, and um, never had any complaints at home. <laughs> but no, I just change your clothes right away. 
Some people will change in the garage and go right into the shower instead of tracking it in the house. So, so yes. Oh, yeah. So before, before the COVID even happened, what was like, out of all the scenes, what was the most common one you guys did? Still natural. Still natural. Mm -hmm. What was that question? The most common type of scene before COVID. It's still natural. For unnatural ones though, I can't say. It Usually it's accidents, overdoses, yeah. And I feel like suicides are increasing this year, but I could be wrong because I get a lot of them. It's hard, I don't keep up with the numbers. Oh really, suicides, okay. Did that, not the best answer. The, okay. So decomps. And you can see the one on the right, that is a body imprint. This person was between the toilet and the wall. So you guys didn't know a lot of people like to die on the toilet. They do. Do you know and, why? Sorry. Can, I know why. I know. Do you guys know why? Any guesses? Were they throwing up? What? Were they throwing up? No. He's very close. There's a nerve and like all this area. If you have a cardiac event going on, sometimes it makes you feel like you have to poop. So, not that scary every time you go to the bathroom, but there's a lot of people who die in the toilet or just after using or feel like they have to go and really they're having a cardiac episode. And a lot of people who also die are naked. Fun fact. House fires. The two on the, the one on the bottom and the left are the same. The one on the right is separate. I couldn't even go on the, this one over here because it was still an active fire when they called me. But thankfully, they found him before and were able to pull him out before he got too bad. So he could be visually identified. He still died as a result of the fire, but they found him pretty right away near the front of the house. Um, like one ago, I want to say. The one on the right, I don't know where it was. You know, how burned was it? Um, burned to a crest like that complete? Which one? The one that I just talked about that they pulled him out? Yeah. No. He looked pretty, he looked okay. He had a couple, I, he died from the soot and smoke because the fire started in the basement and he was able to make his way, try to get out, but he was also a hoarder. So as he was trying to get out, he collapsed. And the fire didn't really get him yet, it was mostly the soot and smoke. Water deaths. These are two separate examples. Usually when we get there, the bodies are already out of the water. The one in the bottom right, I'm sure you heard of the one in Okachi Lake a couple years ago. We've been there for like 20 years or whatever. That's him. I don't remember when it was. He went missing in the 90s when he was on a boat diving with friends and family and he never surfaced. And he just happened to surface a couple years ago when I was working and on call. The, the white stuff you see, it's called adipocere. It's a very hard, waxy substance. So it kind of protected him. And I don't know what caused him to float up. I was told by DNR, something with the tide or the water, it was different that year. But that's him. We did him through DNA. That's how we identified him. It doesn't water help water deaths help preserve bodies longer as well? Uh, as in? Colder water temperatures. So yeah, yep. He's been on there for 20 years if he was outside. In the colder water, yeah, cold helps preserve bodies. Um, and especially if he's down below, like tucked away somewhere, which we think he was, that made the adipocere form and protect him until he started floating and, yeah. Were you able to get cause of death with it just drowning? I think we just put suspected drowning because there's no way to really know. 
Usually for drownings, what we do is we look at the sphenoid in the brain to look for water buildup or in the lungs, and he didn't have either of those. So we just suspected drowning, pretty sure. And sometimes you have to use your best guess. It, you're not always going to know. You can, on the death certificate, you can use possible, probable, or suspected before a cause of death. We, tr we don't like to do that, but in cases like that, you have no choice. Uh, homicides. Guy in a tarp. I don't know if you, you probably know this one. I don't know if you guys keep up on your news. That was a few years ago in Oconomowoc. One on the right, top right, I believe, was Pewaukee a couple of years ago. And I don't know what the bottom right is, but that's an example of the Faro scanner or the 3D scanner. Usually homicides are not as fun or as fancy as they sound. They're more complicated. There's a hundred more people that are trying to get into the scene to figure it out and try to, they each get assigned a job by the captain or the police, whatever. So it's very hard. There's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of waiting around for warrants and for the DA to show up. And you also have to deal with the media who are out there. That's why they have the sheet up because the media, they're always there. Um, the family, you have to shield the family from seeing anything and does a lot of privacy and not telling the family anything. So it's very hard, it takes a long time. Overdoses, these days you have to be careful with anyone you touch, even as a cop. I'm sure you all heard the news a few years ago of the deputy on the freeway, pulled someone over and got exposed to fentanyl. Thankfully, he or she did not die I don't know the exact story, you probably do. If they had a powder on them and it just blew at her or? Yeah, uh, Deputy Carlowitz, who was 9204 working the high that day, um, made a traffic stop and asked for state patrol to come back her up so she could search the vehicle. And during that search, she found a small silver lockbox and picked it up and shook it. And when she shook it, the powder fentanyl came out. She inhaled it. Um, and then she was in her squad car and started the overdose and the guy whose vehicle was, was in the back of the squad started pounding and kicking on the windows to get the attention of the state trooper and it finally did. The suspect actually told the trooper what was going on. The trooper administered Narcan and saved her life. Oh gosh. Yeah. So you just never know. Yeah. A not, a not so happy story. Uh, border Patrol between uh, Mexico and California. Uh, they're coming, cartels coming through now with fentanyl on the base of the trunk, so right when you open it, right in the in the lining, like the, what's it called? The belt of the trunk, it just sprinkles them in there. So when you're searching the trunk, patting it down, you'll get it through your skin, and then usually it'll kick it up, and we've had a few Border Patrol people die already. Are you serious? You never know. That's, that's crazy. Another horrifying thing to wait for it to get up here, right? <sighs> Positional accidents. This, somehow this guy was trying to fix whatever this machine is and kicked the brake. The bucket went up, picked him up with it, and he was found dangling upside down in his driveway by the UPS driver while his wife was inside the whole time. So she didn't see the accident, hear it. A lot of scenes these days are very messy. Not only decoms, but the one on the right is all dog poop. If you've been down for a while or you just don't care about your animal or your house, you let them poop inside or pee inside. You, there's a shovel there, so I imagine that was a normal thing. The one on the left isn't as bad. It's still bad, but that, th that's all poop, feces on the floor, because they were either ill or they just didn't clean up after themselves. That's very common to find a lot of gross toilets and bathrooms. I just don't, don't know if it's because they're sick or... Blood. Just interesting pictures of the footprints. I think these are the same one. I think this guy fell onto a piece of glass and it got his arm and he started running around and he made it to the garage with his phone right next to him. 
So it was just a little too late. This house was used to be the most disgusting house I've been in. This lady had live chickens in her house. Cats who were obviously very sick. Everything was covered in this filmy chicken poop, chicken dust, human dust, whatever. She died because she fell while going in this room and broke her leg and laid there until she died. I know that because I brought her back for autopsy and her whole leg was bruised. And so we did x-rays and I'm assuming she just tripped over this bucket thing and then the chicken tried to keep her warm because it was the middle of winter. I don't know, I had the cops move the chicken. So if you're going to be a cop, be prepared to move chickens. And like I said, I thought she just laid there and died because she's old. They're not always as they appear. We found the broken leg or you find this. That is a clot the size of about a fist. They were found on this pillow with blood. And of course, naturally, you think it's suspicious. The police freak out. They don't know if that's a liver or whatever the heck that is, some kind of organ. It turns out this person had cancer, lung cancer. And once you get the radiation treatments and all your therapies, you're at risk for coughing up clots and a lot of blood. So when we, we got there, we calmed the police down and things made sense with what Allison saw that no, this person had cancer, they must have had a coughing fit or weren't feeling well. Effects of the radiation, you know, got to them and one of the arteries wore down and they bled. So it was completely natural. Another thing, this looks like a murder scene but really, um, this guy had a fistula. Do you guys know what that is? When you get dialysis, they put something in your arm right here, a little spot to connect the dialysis machine. That ruptured. So it was very, he was very old, so it was probably very old, and it just broke down. So the vein or whatever it was in, it just ruptured. Actually, I'm thinking an artery looking at the spray. So. Pretty sure that was considered natural, too, because it's a potential complication of having a fistula. Elderly lady in bed. We go there, we do our initial stuff. Looks natural, looks like she wasn't feeling well and just sat down or laid down. Until you do your exam and you see she's covered in fentanyl patches. I believe this was a suicide. We've had people put them in their mouths, people who suck on the patches. Fun fact, it'll kill you in about five minutes and you won't notice until you're about a minute in. That For what? Kind of fentanyl. Oh, really? Interesting. So a lot of times, if you, by the time you notice you have it, you call an ambulance, you're going to get it. Too late. Good to know. All right, so body exam. This is one of the big things we do. More, the top three things I'm pretty sure are important for you guys to know. Rigor mortis, liver mortis, algor mortis. Rigor mortis is the stiffening of the muscles. That's the top right picture. She died on her stomach with her arm hanging off the bed. When I flipped her over on her back, her arm stayed up. It's a breakdown of some of the chemicals in the body that make your muscles stiff. We use that to help determine timing of death. If you don't have rigor, you died more recently than the last couple hours. If you have some rigor, it's been maybe a couple more hours. If your whole body's stiff and we can't move you at all, it's probably been 12 to 24 hours, depending on the environment and what, like your body, like were you sick? If you have a fever, things are gonna speed up in your body. If it's hot outside, it's gonna speed things up. Sorry, I keep moving the mouse. Um, so rigor mortis is very important for that. Doesn't it go away? It does. It goes away naturally. After maybe 24, 36 hours, it depends again. I know it's a 12-hour window. It's very hard. But it will go away naturally, and you can tell um, after some time with some practice. So if it starts to go away naturally, you can tell, and then you know it's been a day or two. 
Liver mortis or lividity also helps us with that. That is what you see on the bottom picture. That's the blood settling. Blood will settle in whatever position you are towards the bottom. So if I got there and this guy in the bottom died on his stomach, or was found on his stomach, I should say, and I see that once I flip him over, I know something's wrong. Because if he died on his stomach and I flip him over on his back and see white at the top, that means someone manipulated his position. Does that make sense? If you die in your stomach, that, that red stuff should have been on the front and the white would have been at the bottom. That helps us with timing because lividity changes colors. It can move. Like if I manipulate the body and I leave it in a different position for a while, it can resettle. It can be fixed, which means it's not going to move. That helps us with the time of death too. More examples of rigor mortis. Lividity. On the top left where you see the glove, that's an example of blanching. So they push on it, it leaves a white mark, that means it's more fresh and it's not completely fixed or settled yet. On the bottom left, that's fixed. That's 36 plus hours. And then on the right side, that's just showing the gravity, how it goes with gravity. You can see a little bit on the heel, on the top, but otherwise it went down there. And I'm sure there's some underneath here too. They leave patterns if it's long enough. This person on the left died on their stomach with their hand on their chest. They were dead so long that the, the pattern is never going to go away. The one on the right, this is someone we brought in that must have been fresh or newly deceased because you can see the mark, the white mark on their back is from our autopsy table. You can see the little slat down here. That's the pressure from that. So when we brought them in, their lividity was not fixed. So. Carbon monoxide poisoning usually leaves you a little more pink or cherry red. It's hard to tell. Maybe you guys can tell better up there. But the one on the left is supposed to be carbon monoxide poisoning, which is a little more pinkish cherry red versus regular lividity, which is usually a little more purple. Decomp. I don't know. How are we doing on time? 15, okay. I'm going to go through this a little fast. Um, basically, decomp starts the minute you die on a cellular, cellular level until it gets to the point where you can see it externally. It usually starts on your, in your abdomen. You start to turn green, usually the lower right, and then it works its way up because that's where your gut is, all the bacteria. You start to expand, like this one on the right here. His stomach is expanded. He's green. You start to marble which are the lines you see from the gases just pushing, pushing on your veins and everything in your body. And that usually is about three to five days. You then start to get what we call skin blebs. They're big, big blisters full of fluid. Usually that's more than five days or so. You can see it here. That's all, the gases push the skin and make you expand. And the outer layer of skin will expand too. And then the, your body is how much percent liquid? You could see it in there at the bottom. These pop very easy. They get on us. They get everywhere. This is the worst part of a decomp. You can see it here too on this guy's leg. These are examples of the aftermath or of popped blebs or blisters here on the floor. You could see it around this individual who had been laying in his bed for some time. He was there so long they popped on their own. So you can see it's all wet under here. And if you look, this white stuff underneath him, those are probably fly eggs or maggots. I don't, can't tell. And here we are, maggots. This one on the left, it is inside of the skin. He's been there so long that the blisters popped, the skin expanded, and maggots got inside. The guy on the right, I believe, was outside. Mummification, 
You've all heard of that, I'm sure. That's just the drying of the skin. We tend to see that in more of the smaller people. If you don't have a lot of body fat. Like I said, the adipose here, this is the same guy that was in the water. It's that hard, waxy substance. Does anyone know what these are caused from? Petechia. Have you heard that phrase before? This is, you, we usually see it in the eyes from hangings. The pressure on the arteries makes the tiny blood vessels burst in your eyes. You can also see it if you're in some kind of accident where something crushes you like on your chest. You'll see it on these all over your chest and your face. Edema. That is fluid buildup. On the left, you can see an older person who has it in her legs and feet. She is in severe heart failure. When your heart doesn't function properly, fluid builds up in your body. On the right, that's edema or a foam cone, we call it, that's coming from his lungs. Whether he had a heart attack or he was in heart failure or an overdose. We usually always see that in an overdose because most of these drugs people take are respiratory depressants, which means your breathing slows down, you're gonna get that fluid build up and it's gonna come out. So Allison put this in here. Are most of you in here to be law enforcement or I'm assuming, okay. Or EMS or something. How to assist our office. Anywhere you go when you're doing a death investigation, whether it's us, different county, just, it's good to keep in mind just to be mindful before you move a person or disturb the scene. We are independ an independent agency. We, yes, we work together to figure out what happened, but we come in with our, and do our own independent thing. We take our own pictures. We do our own investigation. I look at the whole scene. I need to know where his pill bottles were. Most of the, that's one of the biggest things. They move the pill bottles. Well, if they're found right next to him and you move them, how can I prove they were there? I'm glad you have your pictures and your observations, but we're supposed to be independent. Also the gun, the weapons, those get moved a lot too. How do I know the gun was in his hand or where it was now that I'm there and you already have it boxed up? It's very important for the scene to be kept intact. We've had some EMS personnel move the bodies, even though they're clearly dead. One of them even took her out of the apartment in the ambo and around the block because she had family in the apartment. I'm sorry for the family, but you just ruin, disturbed an investigation because you're going, we go into these things, this could be a homicide. How do we know what this is? We had one in a positional death that EMS decided to move. So the next day we went back with a dummy and made them recreate it. So just be mindful of that. And call us as soon as possible that your investigation allows. Obviously, if you need a warrant to get in the house, like in a homicide, it's gonna, that could take some time. But we have agreements with our DA's office and police departments that we should be called even before you get a warrant. Because if we can just go in and assess the body without touching it really, or disturbing it too much, we're the ones who have to determine the timeline of death. If you wait 10 hours to call us, which has happened, it gets harder to determine, estimate the time of death, if that makes sense. So if you call us in right away, we can give you a better timeline or estimated time of death than is if you wait five, six, 10 plus hours, which has happened. So, especially in like car accidents, please don't wait. Call us as soon as possible. That's it. Any questions? I'm just right on time. Anything, yeah. Do you guys allow autopsies to be like observed? We do. If you are like a medical student or EMS or police, we typically do. Um, we'd have to set it up beforehand though. But we have done that. I think, I don't know, a lot of the dispatchers have asked us to. I don't know if we've ever had them come in though. So it really depends. Any other questions? Anything? Pretty much an open book. Yeah. How much do you guys make on average? Uh, you start around 23. 
And then you work your way up. I'm, I've been there for seven years, so I'm kind of in the middle. But you start around there. Any other questions? Okay. Well, if you do, take down our emails, or he can give it to you, and feel free to reach out. All right? Thank you.